Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so I just want to share with you some thoughts that I've had recently and something that I've discovered here. Um, that ever since hearing Robert Baker talk about the crucifixion and what happened there and everything, the atonement, and uh, made me question some things again. You know, I don't really like the idea of the Father pouring out his wrath on the Son. And I don't really see that in Scripture. There's some verses here or there that people might try to get that from that need to be examined closer. But I know that it's popular in Christianity, and it's what I've kind of previously believed, I guess, without really looking into it a lot. Probably a lot of people that have subscribed or are listening to this right now believe that. But I see a lot of problem with that. And obviously, the Father did not forsake the Son. Even though Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't mean that the Father did forsake him, because if the Father forsook the Son, which is absurd to even imagine that, uh, you know, the Godhead would cease to exist, it, it doesn't make any sense. And for the Father to punish the Son or to pour out his wrath on him for sin doesn't sit well with me either, and it's pretty much... What Anderson teaches that Jesus had to suffer for our sins, so he went to hell for three days and three nights. And, you know, it's like if Jesus truly had to suffer for sins, then he'd have to be in hell for an eternity. You know, to me, that's the only way it would make sense, and that makes no sense at all. So I think that it makes no sense at all to say that the Father poured out his wrath on the Son in any way. And, you know, there's the verses that, you know, that Jesus became sin for us, basically, that, that we become righteousness in him. And there, you know, it talks about him drinking from the cup of wrath or whatever like that. There's some things like that that I think need to be examined and understood proper. So I'm looking at some alternatives to what is called the penal substitution or the penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, and so. I've came across something called the satisfaction theory of atonement, which is, I guess, what Catholics believe. And just because Catholics believe something doesn't make it right or wrong. Obviously, the core Catholic doctrines, you know, salvation by, you know, maintaining or gaining your salvation or maintaining it by the sacraments and penance and stuff is false. You know, the worship of Mary, the veneration of Mary and the saints, the... Um, you know, there's lots of things like that. Basically, you know, the worst salvation thing is, is the worst, you know, and they're, they're teaching of the church and the pope and all this. Uh, you know, that's the core of Catholicism, but, you know, they do affirm the Trinity. They affirm a lot of proper doctrines. So just because this is what they believe about the atonement doesn't necessarily make it wrong. And I'm learning that the penal substitutionary atonement uh, basically kind of has some ties to Calvinism, even though Arminians are free will, people that believe in free will, which I do, obviously. They, they believe in it too, but I think that it does have some roots in Calvinism, and it could be linked to that and something that I want to look into more. But anyways, here's the Wikipedia page. I'm just researching. I've got different tabs open, and I've got different tabs on my phone open. See the problems with penal substitution theory, and you know, uh, talking about talking about it on here and stuff. So, uh, satisfaction theory of atonement is a theory in Christian theology that Jesus Christ suffered crucifixion as a substitute for human sin. So, the satisfaction theory still still has the substitution part. It's saying that that Christ is our substitute. Okay. Um, so there are some radical ideas on the atonement, ones that I would completely reject, that are obviously wrong to me, like stuff like Jesse Morrell teaches, like sinless perfection, which another thing is I've, I've suggested in a recent video, Jesse Lee Peterson, I think he's really interesting, he's a conservative, and you know, he's a Christian, but recently I just came across a video where he says that he's sinless, and he's without sin, and I don't agree with that, and... He's also saying that pornography is not a sin, and so, you know, the first time that I heard him say he was, like, spot on, I was like, man, this guy is really good, and then I heard some stuff that's, like, way off recently, so, 
But I still think it's interesting to listen to, but that, that was really bothersome, that stuff. Uh, anyway, there are some far-off ideas of the atonement. And so far from what I've read about the satisfaction theory, uh, it seems pretty good to me, but I want to... I definitely need to learn more about it. It still teaches that Christ is a, was a substitute for our sin, satisfying God's just wrath against humankind's transgression due to Christ's infinite merit. The theory draws primarily on the works of Anselm of Canterbury. It's been traditionally taught in the Roman Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed traditions of Western Christianity. Theologically and historically, the word satisfaction does not mean gratification, as in common usage, but rather to make restitution. So the satisfaction theory of atonement, atonement means to make restitution, mending what has been broken, or paying back what was taken. Since one of God's characteristics is justice, affronts to that justice must be atoned for. It is thus connected with the legal concept, concept of balancing out an injustice. Anselm regarded his satisfaction view of atonement with a distinct improvement over the older ransom theory of atonement, which he saw as inadequate. Anselm's theory was a precursor to the refinements of Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin and introduced the idea of punishment, meet, punishment to meet the demands of divine justice. So it's saying John Calvin and Thomas Aquinas introduce the idea of punishment to meet the demands of divine justice. So that's more of the penal substitutionary atonement. Um, and so I'm just reading through some of this stuff, not really getting all of it. You might not get all of it. Some of you might, and I'd like to hear your comments and your thoughts on this. And if you think that the penal substitutionary atonement, or if you think that the Father pouring out his wrath on the Son is accurate, and you think that you have verses that support that, then I want to have those verses in the comments so I can look at them. Um, I think I got a little bit from this. I've kind of already read it before, but I'll read a little more of this. I probably won't read all of it, but the development of the theory, let's see, what do I want to look at? Yeah, let's look at the development of the theory, I guess. We've got Calvin. Uh, the classic uh, Ansel, Anselmian formulation of the satisfaction view should be distinguished from penal substitution. Both are forms of satisfaction theory and how they or that they speak of how Christ's death was satisfactory. But penal substitution and Anselmian satisfaction offer different understandings of how Christ's death was satisfactory. Anselm speaks of human sin as defrauding God of the honor he is due. So the guy who came up with the satisfaction theory of atonement, said that human sin is defrauding God of the honor he is due. Christ's death, the ultimate act of obedience, brings God great honor. As it was beyond the call of duty for Christ, it is more honor than he was obliged to give. Christ's surplus can therefore repay our deficit. Hence, Christ's death is substitutionary. He pays the honor to the Father instead of us paying. Penal substitution differs in that it sees Christ's death not as repaying God for lost honor, but rather paying the penalty of death that had always been the moral consequence for sin. The key difference here is that Anselm, for Anselm, satisfaction is an alternative to punishment. The honor taken away must be repaid, or punishment must follow. By Christ satisfying our debt to honor God, we must avoid punish, or we avoid punishment. By Christ, by Christ satisfying our debt to honor God, we avoid punishment. In Calvinist penal substitution, it is the punishment which satisfies the demands of justice. Okay. Another distinction must be made between penal substitution, uh, Christ punished instead of us, and substitutionary atonement, Christ suffers for us. Uh, both affirm 
the substitutionary and vicarious nature of the atonement, but penal substitution offers a specific explanation as to what the suffering is for, punishment. Augustine teaches substitutionary atonement. However, the specific interpretation differed as to what the suffering for sinners meant. The early church fathers, including Athanasius and Augustine, taught that through Christ's suffering in humanity's place, he overcame and liberated us from death and the devil. Thus, while the idea of substitutionary atonement is present in nearly all atonement theories, the specific idea of satisfaction and penal substitution are later developments in the Latin Church. <clears throat> so, from what I understand, it's kind of like, um, well, they say kind of the penal substitution theory is kind of all about God's wrath. And the satisfaction theory is more about his love and his mercy. And the satisfaction theory is saying that what God wants is for us to honor him. And since Jesus was, you know, perfectly sinless and perfectly obedient, you know, he, high, he honored God to the highest. And because he honored God to the highest, he wasn't deserving of punishment. And so vicariously through Jesus, you know, we get that benefit of him honoring God to the highest, and and he didn't, you know, uh, have to be punished, and so we don't have to be punished. Um, and, you know, the penal substitution theory, saying that God, God the Father poured his wrath on the Son kind of pits God against God, you know, uh, within the Godhead, the persons against each other. And that just doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem biblical. Um, some of these other ones, I don't really know what to say. These pages, I was just looking through them, whether they're wrong or not. Uh, problems with the penal substitution theory. But there's other, other theories in here, the Christus Victor theory, and I don't know if that is the same as satisfaction theory or not. Uh. So I would like to do a lot more of this in the future on this, so you know, I won't have any really good study on this probably for a couple months, but I'm just kind of exploring it now. And I'd like to hear your thoughts, and when I learn a little bit more and read through these articles a little more, I might make another video in the next few days or something to share more that I've come up with. But thanks for watching. God bless.